Good evening, everybody, and sorry for that little bit of uh, flur flurry of confusion at the beginning, but thank you so much for joining us tonight. This year, uh, Heritage Week has a theme, uh, Connections, Roots, and Networks, and I rather think that at least in terms of distance, my talk here will be showing the gr displaying the greatest quantity of all of those things. So let's, let's begin. Antarctica, fifth in size among the world's continents. Its landmass is almost wholly covered by a vast ice sheet. It's often described as a continent of superlatives it's the world's southernmost continent. It's the world's highest, windiest, coldest, iciest, and driest. Technically, Antarctica is a desert. It only gets six inches of rain a year, but that rain freezes and never melts. The temperature is too low, so each year's frozen rainfall has accumulated on top of the previous years over millions of years. I could go on and tell you that it is 5.5 million square miles in size and that thick ice covers 98% of the land, but mere words cannot impart the wonder, the uniqueness, the timelessness of Antarctica. Here's a picture I took in December of last year. And here's a drawing of the Antarctic Peninsula, as first seen by Edward Bransfield in January 1820. As you can see, not much has changed. Edward Bransfield from County Cork is credited with the first sighting of the Antarctic continent on 30th January 1820. On 25th January 2020, in front of a crowd of 500 people, a monument was unveiled in his hometown of Balanokura, just five days prior to the 200th anniversary of his sighting of the Antarctic mainland for the first time. Edward Bransfield was born in 1785. On 2nd June 1803, Bransfield, then 18 years old, was out on his father's fishing boat when he was forcibly removed by British sailors and press ganged into the Royal Navy. Despite this unpromising beginning, young Bransfield began what would be a highly distinguished career in the service. He began as an ordinary seaman and worked his way up to ship's master, the position he occupied in the merchant ship Williams at the time he made his discovery. This is the plinth of the Bransfield Monument, and you could see it has names all around it. These are the names, they're the names of the great Irish explorers. The first one we'll talk about is Robert Ford. Robert Ford was from Movidi near Kilmurray in Cork, and he was one of three naval petty officers from Munster, uh, namely Tom Crean, Patrick Kilhane, and Robert Ford who served on Robert Scott's ill-fated South Pole expedition from 1910 to 1913. Ford was born in 1875, and he was related to the American automobile tycoon Henry Ford. He went to sea in 1891 and joined the Antarctic expedition in 1910 at the request of Scott's deputy, Lieutenant Teddy Evans. Ford, a burly handyman, helped erect Scott's hut at Cape Evans, and that has survived the brutal Antarctic climate for over 100 years and still stands to this day. Robert Ford was invalided home after suffering a severe frostbitten hand when temperatures plunged to mi minus 73 degrees Fahrenheit. He retired to Cork and wore a protective glove for the rest of his life. Ford was the last survivor of Scott's Munster men, and he died in 1959 at the age of 83. 
This is Patrick Kilhane. He was a true man of the sea, brought up near Barry's Point on Cork's Seven Heads Peninsula. His father was coxswain of the Court McSherry lifeboat, which was among the first vessels to reach the Lusitania in 1915. Keohane entered the Navy at age 16, rose to the rank of petty officer, and joined Scott's South Pole Expedition in 1910. Keohane, a rugged, dependable man, marched to within 350 miles of the Pole with Scott in 1911, and helped to bury Scott's dead body a year later. Keohane, who married into a Cork Coast Guard family, later relocated to England. He served in two world wars and lived long enough to serve as an advisor on the movie Scott of the Antarctic in 1947. He died in 1950, age 71. These are the McCarthy brothers, Tim and Mortimer. They were brothers who served with both Scott and Shackleton. They were raised in lower, at Lower Cove overlooking the waters of Kinsale in County Cork. Mortimer, above right, went to sea at the age of 12 and served for over 70 years. An expert mariner, he made three voyages to the Antarctic in Scott's ship Terra Nova and was still working on ships into his 80s. Mortimer made a nostalgic trip back to the Antarctic in 1963 at the age of 81, and he died in New Zealand in 1967, aged 85. Tim McCarthy, above left, a seaman with a flair for handling small boats, joined Ernest Shackleton's endurance expedition in 1914. Tim was a notable crewman on the James Caird, as that lifeboat made its perilous journey from Elephant Island to South Georgia to seek rescue for their comrades who had stayed behind. Shortly after he returned home after surviving the ordeal of the endurance expedition, Tim returned to the sea only to die when his ship SS Narragansett was torpedoed off the Irish coast in March 1917. He was 28 years old. His brother Mortimer collected his polar medal on his behalf. When I first gave this talk, I gave rather short mention to Captain Francis Crozier. Since then, however, he's gotten his own TV series, The Terror, named after the ship he captained in the Franklin Expedition, the other ship being the Erebus. Here he is with his present day incarnation in the form of the actor Jared Harris. Born in 1796 in Banbridge County Down, Crozier attained the rank of captain in the British Navy, in which he served for more than 30 years. Although better known for his Arctic adventures, Crozier journeyed to Antarctica as second in command to Sir James Clark Ross, of Ross Sea fame in 1843. His fame as an Antarctic explorer is recognized by the fact that an important thoroughfare in the Falkland Islands is named for him, that is, the street that leads to the local pub in Port Stanley. I was there past December and I had a pint in his, in his honor. And now we come to Ernest Shackleton, the boss. Shackleton was born on the 15th of February, 1874 in Kilkee, County Kildare. His family was from Yorkshire and his grandfather, Abraham Shackleton, was an English Quaker who moved to Ireland in 1726 and started a school at Ballator, County Kildare. Ernest was the second of 10 children and the first of two sons. The second, Frank, achieved notoriety as a suspect in the 1907 theft of the Irish crown jewels. In 1884, the family moved from Ireland to London. However, Shackleton took lifelong pride in his Irish roots and frequently declared, I am an Irishman. 
Shackleton joined the British Merchant Navy when he was 16 and qualified as a master mariner in 1898. Here's the famous recruitment ad for the Endurance Expedition. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. This ad is now generally regarded as apocryphal, but I think we can apply Oscar Wilde's standard here and agree never to spoil a good story with the facts. There's an excellent museum and memorial dedicated to Ernest Shackleton in Athai County, Kildare. The museum is presently closed for redevelopment works, but their website, shackletonmuseum.com, is full of interesting and useful information, and I heartily recommend that you visit it, as well, well as the museum itself when it reopens. Which brings us to the awesome Tom Crean who was born on 25th February, 1877, in Gortokran near Anaskol in County Kerry. Tom was one of 10 children and his family lived in harsh and rugged conditions on their farm, a background which may have helped prepare him for the privations of Antarctic exploration. Tom left school at age 12 to help on the farm and eventually left to join the British Navy when he was only 15 years old. Tom worked his way up to petty officer second class and in 1901 was present in Littleton, New Zealand, where Captain Robert Falcon Scott was recruiting for the Discovery Expedition. As luck would have it, a member of Scott's crew, a man named Harry Baker, got into a fight and struck a petty officer, and rather than stay and face his punishment, he deserted, leaving the ship a man short. The call went out for a replacement, and it was 24-year-old Tom Crean who volunteered to voyage southwards. And so it began. Here are two photographs taken over a century apart that span Crean family history. On the left is the famous photo of Tom cradling sledge dog puppies taken by Frank Hurley, the expedition photographer in Antarctica during the Endurance Expedition. And on the right is a photo of Tom's great grandson, Kean Darcy, which was taken in August 2016. And you can see the family resemblance is very striking. Captain Robert Falcon Scott was born on 6th June 1868, the third of six children. There was a strong naval and military tradition in the family. Scott's grandfather and four uncles all served in the army or navy, and Scott began his naval career in 1881 as a 13-year-old cadet. He was working his way up the officer ranks when his father became bankrupt and Scott assumed the sole responsibility for his family's support. It has been suggested that this, rather than any direct interest in Arctic exploration, led to his cultivating Sir Clements Markham, the head of the Royal Geographical Society, and obtaining his support for his first Antarctic expedition on the discovery. Organized under a joint committee of the Royal Society, and the Royal Geographical Society, the Discovery Expedition carried out scientific research and geographical exploration on what was then largely an untouched continent. It launched the Antarctic careers of many who would become leading figures in what has become known as the heroic age of Antarctic exploration, including Scott, the expedition leader, Ernest Shackleton, Edward Wilson, Frank Wilde, Tom Crean, and William Lashley. Although the expedition failed to reach the South Pole, they succeeded in traveling farther south than anyone had ever gone before. It was left to the Terra Nova expedition to complete the journey. In 1910, Scott embarked on his most ambitious expedition to date, 
aiming to explore uncharted wastelands, conduct scientific studies, and above all else, to become the first person to reach the South Pole. This contemporary newspaper photo shows a number of the key members of the expedition, and the caption makes reference to the rough and unkempt appearance of the party. That's Tom Crean on the far right. You can see he he's towers above just about everybody else. One of the other people in the photos, I, in the photo is, is uh, Mears, who was from Kilkenny, and he was in charge of the dogs on the expedition. But because one, he didn't do a particularly good job, and two, he really is a very peripheral character. I'm not going to be speaking about him. At the edge of the barrier on the volcanic shores of Ross Island, the expedition's shore party unloaded sled dogs, ponies, motorized sledges, and a prefabricated 50 by 25 foot wooden hut with quilted seaweed insulation. A stickler for the proprieties, Scott ordered a partition to be built down the center of this hut so that the officers could have separate sleeping quarters from the other ranks. Scott has been much criticized for his transport choices. While he took motor sleds, ponies, dogs, and an expert Norwegian skier, Trygvi Gran, whose job was to teach the men to ski, each of these resources was poorly used. The largest of the three motor sledges was lost while being taken ashore, and the remaining two failed and could not be fixed. Snowshoes were brought for the ponies to keep them from sinking into the soft snow, but they weren't used, thus greatly limiting the horse's usefulness. Not enough of the men were expert enough with the dogs to be effective, and there were insufficient dogs in the first place. Finally, while Scott encouraged his men to learn to ski, they were reluctant, and he did not insist on them learning. He was left with the most exhausting and slowest possible method of transport, namely manhauling, which he considered to be more noble than relying on beasts. Progress consisted of hauling supplies by sled and caching them in strategic locations along the way. After each cache was established, members of the expedition would return to base the party was eventually whittled down to eight members, four of whom would make the final push for the pole. Now the photo on the right here embodies just about everything that was misguided about Scott's expedition. You could see that the men are hauling the sleds and the dogs are trotting along beside them. Scott waited until the very last minute to announce which four men of the eight, the final eight, he would take to the pole with him. However, when he did make his selection, at the last minute he decided to take five men and send three back. Scott announced that he, Wilson, Oates, Bowers, and Petty Officer Edgar Evans would go forward while Lieutenant Teddy Evans William Lashley and Tom Crean would return to Cape Evans. Tom Crean, the strongest member of the party, was bitterly disappointed, but this decision very likely saved his life. Sadly, of all the poor decisions that Scott made, this was the one that sealed his and his comrades' fate. For one thing, when you are in such a harsh, unpredictable, and unforgiving environment, and you've only brought along provisions for four people, adding a fifth to the equation is extremely risky. As well, all eight men were already exhausted from pulling the sleds and the general rigors of the weather, hunger, and other privations. Whereas if Scott had made his decision earlier, it's possible that the ones chosen could have been spared some of these ordeals in order to leave them in better shape for the push to the pole. And this also put a severe burden on the three men left to return to base, since if something went wrong, 
and one of them became disabled, the other two would be in extreme danger. And in fact, that is exactly what did happen. On January 17, 1911, Scott's Polar Party finally arrived at the South Pole. Despite the enormity of their achievement, the men were deflated and defeated. For when they reached the pole, they discovered a tent left by Roel Amundsen and his team with a letter addressed to the King of Norway, together with a note addressed to Scott asking him if he, if he would be kind enough to deliver it. The note also gave details of the Amundsen party's arrival at the pole some 34 days prior to Scott's. Scott and his colleagues went ahead and staked the Union Jack, but their spirit was broken. Meanwhile, some 350 miles distant from Scott's polar party, Crean, Evans, and Lashley had uh, rather amazingly made it to within 35 miles of Hut Point. Lieutenant Teddy Evans, who was near death from scurvy, was being quite heroically hauled along the barrier on the sledge by Crean and Lashley, who had disobeyed his direct order to leave him behind and save themselves. It became apparent to Crean and Lashley, though, that Evans would certainly die before they reached the hut, and at their current pace, it would take them four or five days to complete the journey, time that Evans did not have. A tent was pitched, and Tom Crean volunteered to complete the journey alone, leaving Lashley to care for Evans. Crean's solo march took him just 18 hours to complete, an incredible feat coming at the end of an arduous 1,500-mile round trip. The alarm was raised, and a rescue party found the two men, and Evans would survive his ordeal. Both Tom Crean and William Lashley would later receive the Albert Medal for their heroic actions. Another aspect of Crean's heroism, worth pointing out, is that in the British Navy of that era, only officers were instructed in the art of navigation. So Tom Crean undertook his solo trek, trusting to blind luck and his own inner strength and fortitude. Meanwhile, the men at Hut Point eagerly awaited news of Scott and his companions. When time passed without any sign of them, they sent out a search party. On November 12th, the search party spotted a cairn-like mound and soon realized that it was Scott's tent. Inside, they discovered the frozen bodies of Scott, Wilson, and Bowers. The search party removed their personal effects, letters, and journals, and through Scott's journal, which he kept very nearly up to the moment of his death, they learned of the circumstances of the deaths of Edgar Evans and Lawrence Oates. The men left the bodies of their comrades where they lay and collapsed the tent on top of them. They built a cairn of snow over the tent and fashioned a cross which they placed on top. The search party then trekked to the point where Oates had walked to his death, but no trace of him was ever found. So they decided to head back to Cape Evans and await the return of the Terra Nova. They departed Antarctica in February 1913, and upon arriving in New Zealand, the world would learn of the tragic story of Scott's polar party. Lieutenant Oates, he of the famous exit line, I am just going outside and I may be some time also had connections with Ireland, having been stationed in the Curra in County Kildare for four years. He had liked Ireland so much that he was planning to return there to live after the expedition. He never made it. Meanwhile, Ernest Shackleton, who had also been a member of Scott's Discovery Expedition, set himself the challenge of becoming the first man ever to cross Antarctica by land through the South Pole from the Weddell Sea to the Ross Sea. 
The ship chosen for the expedition was the Endurance, built in Norway and launched on 17 December 1912. She was initially named Polaris and was specifically designed for operating in ice-covered waters. The expedition left the UK in August 1914 and departed from South Georgia for the Weddell Sea on 5th December. Just to give you some idea of the distances covered by Shackleton and his men in the course of their adventures, they started out, okay, here's South Georgia. Now, follow, if, if you're looking at this line, okay, start here at South Georgia, and as I recite the distances, you're looking up, around and up, okay. So, starting out in the endurance from Gritvigan Whaling Station in South Georgia, on 5th uh, December 1914, they sailed 4,739 kilometers to the tip of Antarctica. After the, the ice-bound endurance was abandoned, the men sailed to Elephant Island in, the, in three leaky lifeboats, a distance of some 3,993 kilometers. From Elephant Island to South Georgia in the James Caird, they traveled some 1,321 kilometers. And then when Shackleton went out searching for a ship with which to rescue his men, he ended up in Punta Arenas, Chile, some 2,235 kilometers from South Georgia, from where in the Yelho, piloted by Captain Luis Pardo, it was yet another 1,292 kilometers to Elephant Island and his stranded men. Just to show you, this is a model. Uh, I was in Ushuaia in December, which is the southernmost inhabited part of the world. And they have a wonderful museum there. A, a museum of, of uh, Antarctic exploration. And this is a very, very accurate model of the endurance. So the ship set sail. Well, ah, what happened? My gosh, there was a stowaway. Pierce Blackborough, a 16 year old Welsh sailor, found himself stranded after his ship was wrecked in Uruguay. He and two other crew members traveled to Buenos Aires in search of new employment. His two friends were taken on by Shackleton, but not Pierce, who was judged to be too young. With the connivance of his friends, he stowed away. After three days, when he reckoned it was too late for them to turn back, he revealed himself. Brought before the boss, Shackleton agreed to keep him on, nevertheless, warning him that did you know that on these expeditions we often get very hungry? And if there is a stowaway available, he is the first to be eaten. To which Blackborough replied, they'd get a lot more meat off you, sir. Shackleton hid a grin and said to one of the crew members, introduce him to the cook. Blackborough proved an asset to the ship as a steward and was eventually signed on though always under the promise that he would be the first to be eaten should they run out of food. He's shown here with the famous cat, Mrs. Chippy, McNeish the carpenter's cat. In case you were wondering how this male cat came to be called Mrs. Chippy, on ships the various functionaries are called after their specialties. An electrical officer is a lecky, a radio officer is a Sparks or a Sparky, and the carpenter is a Chippy. Hence, the carpenter's cat is Mrs. Chippy. I bet you always wanted to know that. <laughs> so, going back a bit, South Georgia had been the Endurance Expedition's last port of call before it headed for the Weddell Sea. South Georgia was an uninhabited island, except for the small community of Norwegians who manned the whaling stations on its eastern shore. 
Shackleton was warned by the whalers that that season's ice was particularly bad in the Weddell Sea, and it extended further north than they had ever seen it. Despite this advice, Shackleton left South Georgia on December 5th, 1914 for Arctic shores, and a mere two days later, they were maneuvering through pack ice. They would battle through the ice for weeks, their progress slow, with some occasional breaks in the dense pack until finally on January 17, 1915, they could see land in the distance. However, on the following day, the ship was halted in its course by the ice, which would never thereafter release its grip on the vessel. Attempts were made by members of the crew to cut a path through the ice in front of the ship, but they could not free it and the men abandoned ship. They set up housekeeping in tents on the ice and Shackleton christened this patience camp. The photo shows Shackleton and Frank Hurley, the photographer, and they amused themselves as best they could, including playing soccer while they waited for the ice to free the ship. But the ice remained inexorable, and in November 21st, 2015, the ship finally sank. And at this point, there was nothing to be done except take to the lifeboats. The three lifeboats, the James Caird, the Dudley Docker, and the Stancombe Wills, bore the names of the chief financial backers of the expedition. Shackleton himself took command of the largest of the lifeboats, the James Caird. The Dudley Docker was commanded by Frank Worsley, and Tom Crean assumed command of the Stancombe Wills. Tom Crean kept the Wills afloat, sailing through a labyrinth of ice and battling the rough sea, while all the time the boat was taking on water and constantly needed to be bailed out. Conditions on all three boats were appalling, as the soaked and hungry men suffered from seasickness and diarrhea caused by the men's final meal before taking to the boats, which comprised killing and eating the remaining dogs, as well as the freezing temperatures. At night, the men would huddle together to generate heat and would awake covered in permafrost. Many accounts written afterwards refer to the indomitable spirit of Tom Crean during the voyage and his constant singing of the wearing of the green, even at times of ultimate peril. None of these accounts allude to him singing it well, by the way, uh, quite the opposite in fact, but his cool and calm demeanor in the face of danger was amazing and did not go unnoticed. This is a photo I took of Elephant Island. My ship sailed there along the same route as the lifeboats took. I sat up all night looking out from my balcony and the only things visible were sea and sky. And eventually this barren rock in the middle of nowhere. The three lifeboats spent seven wretched days at sea before they finally sighted the mountainous peaks of Elephant Island. They were the first men ever to set foot on Elephant Island, and they knew they would have to get off of it as soon as possible. This was because Elephant Island was one of the most remote places on Earth, nowhere near any of the shipping lanes, so there was no hope of rescue from any passing vessels. To escape, they would have to set sail again. Shackleton decided to take a crew of six in the James Caird, the largest of the three boats, while the other 22 men would stay behind to wait, hope, and pray. Tom Crean and Frank Wilde were asked by Shackleton to remain on the beach and take charge of the men, but Crean, instead of thanking his lucky stars not to have been chosen, pleaded successfully with Shackleton to be among the crew of the James Caird. 
So they got the, the they got the care as as prepared as they could for the arduous journey ahead. Uh, in this instance, McNeish the carpenter was especially valuable to everybody. They modified, as I say, the lifeboat for the journey ahead. The plan: six men equipped only with a sextant would attempt to sail a lifeboat 800 miles through the world's roughest waters across the Weddell Sea, aiming at a speck of land called South Georgia. This is the crew of the James Caird. The top row is Shackleton, Worsley, and Crean, and the bottom row is McNeish, the carpenter, Tim McCarthy, and Vincent. Shackleton is very regularly cited these days in business courses uh, as, as, as for his leadership skills. And one of the things that he did in this instance, which is often given, oops, sorry about that folks, is often given as an example, oops, it's, it's going, going backwards, I'd better, uh, an, an example of his, his great leadership skills is that he took McNeish and Vincent with him. They were the expedition's troublemakers. And they, he, most, most men would have left them behind. And he took, he took them with him, feeling that they would be better under his watchful eye rather than to leave them behind. He felt the men on Elephant Island would have enough to contend with. And I think that was a very smart choice, not least because McNeish, and I'll tell you this shortly, ended up being extremely pivotal in this, in, in what happens next. So the waters were wild, they're at sea. The waters were wild, and Tim McCarthy crouched in the bottom of the boat, clutching Frank Worsley, the captain, around the legs to hold him as steady as possible, while Worsley navigated by means of a sextant and dead reckoning. Both of those very primitive methods require sight of the sky, stars, and planets. And since it was mostly overcast and foggy the whole way they were traveling, Worsley largely navigated by means of his extensive experience and uncannily accurate instincts. This navigational feat has been described as the equivalent of hitting a fired bullet with another bullet while blindfolded. Against all odds, the lifeboat reached South Georgia, but on the wrong side of the island. The James Caird had lost its rudder while landing, and the whaling stations the crew needed to reach for help were on the other side of the island. It would have been a journey of about 130 miles by boat, but given the condition of the vessel and some of the men, this was not feasible. The only option was to cross the unexplored and uncharted interior of South Georgia. At this stage, McNeish and Vincent were in very poor condition, so they were left behind in a cave for shelter in the care of Tim McCarthy from Kinsale. Now just look at those peaks. Look at those ice-covered peaks and mountains. That's what they were going to have to cross to get to where they needed to be. After a couple of days rest, Shackleton, Crean, and Worsley prepared to tackle the unknown peaks and glaciers of the island by roping themselves together. And they climbed into the darkness on the early morning of May 19th. Now this is where McNeish was also very valuable to have along. He took, he took wood from the James Caird and, and fashioned things to, runners to put on their shoes, on the men's shoes, spikes and runners to give them a bit more traction going across the ice. And it, I would say that was undoubtedly quite crucial to their success. Okay, so they climbed into the darkness in the early morning of May 19th. Amazingly, and after many precarious incidents, including a blind, desperate toboggan-like slide down an icy slope on a coil of rope, 
and the 30-foot descent down a sheer and freezing waterfall, the men staggered into Stromness whaling station after almost 37 hours of continuous marching. This is the whaling station and you have a better view. Those are the mountains that they came, they came down those mountains to reach, to reach that, the, the whaling station. At first they were regarded with much suspicion these three filthy, drenched, almost decrepit men crawling out of the unknown interior of the island. Children who saw them in the street ran away screaming. Do you blame them? <laughs> However, once they identified themselves to the whalers who had long since assumed the crew of the Endurance was dead, the welcome they received was enormous. Grown men wept in disbelief at the heroic saga of survival of the men who had left South Georgia on the Endurance some 532 days earlier and had somehow made the journey back without their ship, which was lying in pieces almost two miles beneath the surface of the Weddell Sea. Now, I've included a picture here of Tim Jarvis, the famous explorer Tim Jarvis and his team. Uh, who was commissioned by Lady Alexandra Shackleton, uh, the, the great explorer's granddaughter, to duplicate the trip insofar as possible using no technology or items that, they, that, that Shackleton wouldn't have had. And I'm just showing the photo and I am in no way downplaying their great heroism and their, 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 their enormous strength and stamina. But to me, I look, at, I look at these guys, I look at the guys on the left and I look at Tim Jarvis and his team. This is them celebrating after they've, they've finished how clean they are. You know, they look very clean, clean faces. Okay, they have some facial hair, but it's neatly trimmed. Their clothing is quite well, well laundered looking. I just think it, it emphasizes what, what the Shackleton and his, his men went through uh, to, to get there. This is the manager's villa the, uh, in, in uh, Strom, Stromness Whaling Station. Uh, Shackleton, Crean and Worsley were taken there and they were given hot baths, fresh clothing and treated to a luxurious meal. Meanwhile, the whalers of Stromness made haste and soon rescued McCarthy, McNeish, and Vincent from the south of the island. They also found the James Caird, which they carried ashore as a mark of respect to the men. And today the boat sits preserved in Dulwich College, Shackleton's alma mater, in London. But this was the sort of journey where nothing was ever going to be simple or straightforward. Now Shackleton had to find a ship sturdy enough to make the return journey to Elephant Island to rescue his men. After three separate but failed attempts using the ship's The Southern Sky, loaned by the English Whaling Company, uh, the, from 23rd to 31st of May 1916, the ship Instituto di Pesca numero uno, loaned by the government of Uruguay from 10th to 16th June 1916, and the Emma, a sealer, chartered by the British Club of Punta Arenas, Chile, from 12th July to 8th of August 1916, to rescue the men left on Elephant Island, the Yelcho, a 36.5 meter steam tug commanded by Captain Luis Pardo, was authorized by the president of Chile, Juan Luis Sanfuentes, to escort and tow the Emma. When the third attempt with Emma failed, the Chilean government decided to send the Yelcho alone even though it was totally unsuited for Antarctic conditions, lacking as it did proper heating, a radio, or a double hull. There are many unsung heroes, so-called unsung heroes in this story, 
Tom Crean is often referred to as one such, although I think in recent years his profile has, has, has uh, increased considerably. But uh, I think the, 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 one, the, the, the unsung man for me is Captain Pardo. On 25th of August, with Shackleton and the other five men from the James Caird on board, Captain Pardo sailed from Punta Arenas through the Straits of Magellan, an extremely tricky feat of navigation to this day. In November, sorry, in February 2020, when I was a passenger on the Norwegian Star, a large cruise liner possessing every bit of modern nautical technology, the ship took on board two Chilean pilots to assist the captain in completing this part of the journey. By now, the Antarctic winter was at its height, and ice conditions were difficult as the Yelcho neared Elephant Island. But on 30 August, the 22 men were finally rescued. They arrived back in Punta Arenas on 3rd September to a hero's welcome. Captain Pardo was immediately promoted to pilot first class and given several civilian medals and naval honors and credit for 10 years of service for his heroic feat of rescue. The British government tried to give Luis Pardo a monetary reward of 25,000 pounds, an enormous sum of money at the time, for his services in rescuing Shackleton and his men, but he refused it. He said that he had done nothing that one sailor would not do for another. In later years, Pardo's daughter was quoted as saying that her father had declared to his family that he would return with the men on Elephant Island or not at all. Here is a monument to Captain Pardo in Punta Arenas, Chile. There are also monuments to him in Valparaiso and other urban centers, and a postage stamp with his portrait was issued by the Chilean government in 2016 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the rescue. As the Yelcho approached Elephant Island, the men on board counted the dots on the beach and saw to their great joy that all of Shackleton's crew had survived the ordeal. Tom Crean greeted the men by throwing them boxes of cigarettes from the deck of the ship. Reunited at last, they all set sail back to Chile with Captain Pardo at the helm. Many of the party were in very bad condition, but on reaching Punta Arenas, they were greeted by huge crowds who were simply amazed to be witness to the returning cast of what just might be the greatest survival story of all time. Here's Tom Crean when he arrived on Elephant Island and greeted his friend Jan Meacham, who was one of the men left behind. And here is the front page of the Daily Mirror newspaper, dated December 5th, 1916. The front page news, one of the most heroic rescues in history, Sir Ernest Shackleton's 750 mile voyage in a small boat. When Shackleton and his men finally arrived back in England, it was rather like Rip Van Winkle awakening from his long sleep into another era. With World War I raging in Europe, there was no time or inclination on anyone's part to celebrate the achievements of men who had been, in the opinion of many, shirking their duty to their country by engaging in frivolous pursuits such as Antarctic exploration. Tom Crean experienced a similar sense of alienation and that the Ireland he returned to when he retired from the Navy in 1920 after suffering a bad fall was in the midst of the struggle for independence. He kept a very low profile about his time in the British Navy and rarely spoke of his adventures to anyone, nor did he write his memoirs. Most of what we know about him comes from the writings of his colleagues, by whom he was universally respected. He was also held in high esteem by his captain's widows, Kathleen Scott and Emily Shackleton, who kept in touch with him for many years after their husband's passing. 
Tom Crean built a pub, which he named the South Pole Inn, in Anaskol in County Kerry. He married a local girl, er Ellen Herlihy, with whom he had three children. His last surviving child, his daughter Mary O'Brien, died in 2018. His granddaughter, Aileen Crean O'Brien, gives walking tours of Anaskol. This photo shows Tom and his wife, who was known as Nell, the South Pole Inn and his daughters, Mary and Eileen. Ernest Shackleton, on the other hand, never got over his fascination with the Antarctic. In order to raise funds for another expedition, he went out on the lecture circuit, which he endured but did not enjoy. In a way, this required nearly as much endurance as the expedition itself, as you could see from the poster, with two shows every day wherein, as advertised, Shackleton would personally tell his wonderful story of the last Antarctic expedition, illustrated by marvelous moving pictures. Tom Crean died in 1938 at the age of 61, and his funeral was the largest Dennis Skull had ever seen. He'd contracted peritonitis after having to travel to Cork by ambulance when denied a life-saving appendectomy in the Tralee Hospital closest to his home because no doctor capable of performing the surgery was on duty when he was admitted. He and his family are buried in the tomb pictured here, which he constructed with his own hands. Ernest Shackleton's death in 1922 was also something of an anticlimax. Embarked on yet another expedition to Antarctica, he suffered a heart attack while in South Georgia. Expedition doctor Leonard Hussey undertook to accompany the body back to England, but when he arrived in Montevideo in Uruguay, having traveled what was already a considerable distance, he received instructions from Shackleton's wife, Emily, that she wished him to be buried in South Georgia. Hussey therefore turned around and returned there with Shackleton's remains. His grave in South Georgia remains a place of pilgrimage to this day. I don't know, looking at these photos, it seems to me that allowing for the difference in color palettes these two desolately beautiful locations are very much alike and completely suited to be the final resting places of these two remarkable men. And speaking of final resting places, on March 5th, 2022, the Endurance 22 expedition located the wreck of Endurance which had not been seen since it was crushed by ice in the Weddell Sea in 1915. And you can see the name Endurance. This is the hole at the bottom of the ocean, and you could see the name Endurance here, clear, clear as could be. Here is a picture of the deck, the upper deck. You can see the the wheel, and it looks, to me anyway, it sort of looks, it looks like it, it, it looks like there's dust. It, it, it almost looks like it's up in an attic rather than, than miles under the ocean uh, with, 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 with shadows and dust and everything, but that's it at the bottom of the ocean. And harking back to Frank Worsley's amazing navigational skills, after the sinking, Worsley drew a map on which he indicated his best estimate of where the sunken ship was located, and the Endurance 22 expedition found it within 10 kilometers of this spot. Even though it wasn't part of their original itinerary, the expedition members felt a strong urge to visit Ernest Shackleton's grave before returning home. The graveside ceremony saw contributions from Dr. John Shears, the expedition leader, that's him on the right, 
this knowledge Bengu, the, the Ca Captain Knowledge Bengu, the skipper of the expedition's ship, and that's him on the left. And then the his, uh, let me see now, the marine and the marine archaeologist Menson Bound, which that's him in the middle. In a remarkable coincidence, Endurance 22's submersibles found the sunken Endurance on 5 March 2022, exactly 100 years to the day that Ernest Shackleton's funeral was held in this place. I'd like to finish with two quotes. The first is from Sir Raymond Priestley, an Antarctic explorer and geologist who sailed with both Scott and Shackleton. For scientific discovery, give me Scott. For, fee for speed and efficiency of travel, give me Amundsen. But when disaster strikes and all hope is gone, get down on your knees and pray for Shackleton. And finally, a quote from the, the great nat naturalist David Attenborough. At a time when it's possible for 30 people to stand the on the top of Everest in one day, Antarctica still remains a remote, lonely, and desolate continent, a place where it's possible to see the splendors and immensities of the natural world at its most dramatic and what's more, witness them almost exactly as they were long, long before human beings ever arrived on the surface of this planet. Long may it remain so. Thank you. So, Oh, thank you so much, Brian O'Gorman, a lovely comment. Uh, thank you for celebrating our great explorers and bringing their great expeditions to life. That's very lovely. Thank you very much. I will have a look at the chat to see if there are questions. And then we'll open the floor. Was Cape Evans connected to the Evans brothers? That's a good question. Or was that a coincidence? It is a coincidence, yes. And Brian's excellent comments, some very lovely things from lovely people. Right, so would anybody like to ask a question? I will show the grid video. Uh, oh, let me un unpin myself. Anyway. Right. So, Tim, would you, would you kindly allow people to unmute themselves and ask uh, ask questions? Oh, I see. Uh, Noel Noel Stapleton has asked, "When and how did you manage the cruise you went on?" Okay, I will say this was not an expedition cruise. I did not get off the ship. There were very strict limitations as to the size of ships that are allowed to uh, to to go as far down as well, uh, allowed to disembark on the Antarctic continent. I was on a ship that sailed through the various channels and around and the peninsula. Uh, it was the Norwegian Star. It, it the weather is so uncertain it, it started the, the cruise started in buenos aires and went to various ports in patagonia all of which were fascinating and it was a bit of there was an uncertainty as to whether the weather would permit it to go down as far as antarctica i spoke to a young man on my first night on the ship who said it was his third time attempting this cruise. And on the previous two occasions, they were not able to get down to Antarctica. So I said to him, I would throw him overboard as a sacrifice to the sea god Poseidon to ensure that we would be able to get down to Antarctica. Now I did not do this, but this threat was apparently potent enough that the weather 
cooperated and we did get all the way down. I'll see any other questions. Thank you so much. Let's see. Oh, Kevin Kenny. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for your very kind words. The Shackleton Museum is closed for the moment, but the Shackleton Autumn School takes place from the 8th to the 10th of November in a thigh, and the details are on that Shackleton Museum website that I mentioned earlier. It's shackletonmuseum.com, but if you Google Shackleton Museum Athai, you'll find it just as well. And I could not recommend it more highly. And some very, very lovely comments. Uh, would anyone like to ask a question, a, a live question? You, uh, I believe Tim has organized people uh, to be able to unmute themselves. Let's Ah, what was the, okay, uh, uh, Alexandre de Sajouté, I hope I'm pronouncing that with some level of correctness, uh, wants to know about what model of ship is Kilhain painting? The image, yes, he builds mod uh, model ships and this image caught his attention. I can totally understand that and I'm going to beg your indulgence. I have your email address from your registration for this talk. I will look into that and get back to you if that's all right. But th thank you for asking. Any, any questions, li live questions? What I can also do at this point, if people are a bit, uh, uh, well, would prefer, let's put it like this, if they would prefer not to ask a question during the recording, while, while we're recording, I will end the recording now. And then we can have a less formal, less formal chat. So hang on while I manage that. <laughs> 